Well, good morning, church. I'm going to get this out of the way now, so that way if you want to be unhappy with me, you have enough time to get over it. Can I say that? Is that allowed? Um, during that last song, I, I prayed, Now I included myself in this prayer, I want you to know. I prayed that if any of us were singing this song, that I have surrendered all, that I left everyone behind and I, I'm only following Christ, I prayed that if that were to be untrue for anyone in this room, myself included, that, you, that the Lord would keep us awake all night, that he would not allow us to sleep, that we wouldn't have a hunger for food, that we would sweat in times that we shouldn't be sweating, that we would be worried in times that we normally wouldn't worry. I prayed that if we were singing that we have surrendered all and we have not, that he would wreck the inside of us to the point that we would say, if I'm going to say it, then I'm going to live it. And that's for me too. But I prayed that. So I do, I do apologize for praying for you and that it happened to deal with your food schedule and your sleep schedule and your work schedule and your sweat schedule, if you have one of those. My sweat schedule is all the time. All I do is sweat, uh, like a big man trapped in a little man's body. Um, it's very good to be with you guys again. Uh, you guys had the privilege of hanging out with my buddy Bill last week. Uh, great guy, heart for the Lord, and he wanted to let me know, let he wanted me to let you know that he's praying for you this morning. We've been praying for you all week. The small group that we lead has been praying for you all week. We're so happy to be here with you guys, and so happy that you're here. We're going to continue in our study of the Book of Romans. Uh, last last week and the week before, uh, I taught on on Hebrews. We're in the Book of Romans. Uh, we're going to be taking a look at that over the next couple weeks um, to give us a good foundation of solid doctrine and deep truth. Um, I'll I'll confess to you now that this week it was a difficult difficult time for me to study. Uh, I was grumpy. I was impatient. I was irrational. I was uh, I cried. Uh, it happened. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember sitting in the car trying to study this and I just cried because it wasn't going my way. Like it was almost like a, like a, like a panic cry or like, I really want this to work well and it, don't ever do this again, note to self. Um, uh, that was more for me, not you guys. Uh, I, I like broke down and just wept and I was like, God, why can't you just tell me what this is, what I'm supposed to say? Like, can't you just make this easy? Can't you just make this easy? I'm looking online at, at other pastors that are preaching this same text and they've got five to six messages on this just paragraph and I'm like oh so guys that are really smart are spending six weeks on this and I have 30 minutes great so um I had to spend a lot of time praying because I knew I knew somewhere in here there was something that God wanted specifically me to hear he wanted to teach me something before I had any way to bring you anything. I don't know if I learned it yet or not, um, but I've wrestled with this text all week, and I've cried over it. I've screamed at it. I've thrown things because of it. It's, it's been real this week, so I, I want to be transparent with you uh, so that way when you walk out of here this morning, you know, hey, that guy doesn't have it all together either. Um, and he's here with me. Uh, and we all don't have to have it together because we're going to talk about a guy this morning that has it all together. Um, so we're going to continue in Romans. Today we're in Romans 5 if you want to get there. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the, the pew. Uh, they didn't tell me I could say this, so if I'm wrong, I'll pay you back. But if you want that Bible, take it. Just take it. Uh, just take it, please. Like, I'll buy a new one for you. If you need it, take it. And listen, I'm going to give everybody the privilege this morning. If you... If you've never felt the satisfaction of writing something in your Bible, whoo, do it. Like, do it. Like, if you haven't done it and you're worried, like, I don't want to, I don't want to do, my Bible doesn't even have a cover on it, okay? Mine's like, mine's worn slap out. I mean, I have the cover, but it's here. Don't be afraid to spend time in this and put work into it because you're never going to get to heaven and God say, hey, thanks for keeping those pages crystal clear and clean. He's not going to look at me and go, why did you write all over my word? He's going to say, hey, thanks for wrestling with this. Thank you for making notes to yourself that says, hey, this is you, bub. 
This is you when it's talking about bad people. I'm a bad man. I mean, I look like it, but I'm 171 pounds of bad man. <laughs> Telling you what. The theme of this part of Romans is still about justification. The last week we continued in talking with, when Bill was here about what it means to be justified. And so if we just real hover back for Romans right now, Romans chapter 1 through chapter 3 is about man's condemnation before a holy God. Meaning the first three chapters of this letter to the church at Rome was, hey, you are guilty in front of God. Great way to start off a letter. You're guilty, you're bad people. Romans 3 through 5 is about the justification of man. And that's, we're going to be talking about justification, but justification is the, the ruling over our life that we're, we're innocent. So first three chapters, you're, you're guilty. Second, the third, third, fourth, and fifth chapter, you're innocent. I'm sure these people are reading it like, what? come on, man, pick one. Like you said I was guilty, now you said I'm innocent. Like what's going on? Well, this morning's sermon is titled Life After Death. I'm terrible at coming up with titles. Until the last minute, my notes, the title was, write something really cool here so people think I'm awesome. And if you don't believe me, I, I'm honest to goodness, that's what it said. I don't know if I did that. Life after death, that seems real Baptisty and used before, but we're going with it. This week we're in Romans 5, 20, 12 through 21, where we're taking the first three chapters and the next chapters and comparing them. We're going to be comparing condemnation and justification so we can understand what on earth Paul is saying when he says, you're guilty, eh, yeah, but you're innocent. Why is this here? So we have three aims this morning. The aim is to understand our definition of justification to understand our need of justification and understand our means of justification. So we find ourselves at the close of Romans 5. We're going to read this together. Hang in there. Just hang in there. I've read this about a thousand times, and I'm telling myself, just hang in there. All right? So if you've got your Bible, follow along. My translation's a little bit different, but you can do it. I believe in you. You drove an automobile that weighed half of a ton. Wait, wait. We're in Gloucester. You drove a car here that weighs a ton. So if you got here in a one-ton vehicle, you can hang in there with this. So if you don't have a Bible or you don't want to use the one in the pew, we've got it on the screen. Romans 5, verse 12, it says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Verse 15, but the, but the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment follows one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Verse 18, therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation, for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. For by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by one man's obedience, the many were made righteous. The many will be made righteous. Now the law came to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through the righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's pray. God, we come to you this morning and we ask that you would remove any distraction from our hearts, from our minds, and that you would put yourself in the center of everything that we do this morning. If there is anything in me 
that would stop me from 100% truthfully meaning that I have surrendered all, that everything I have is yours and that I am following you. If there's anything in my way, Jesus, keep me up at night. Break me of that. Cause me to be ruined, as Isaiah said. Ruin me to the point that all I have is you because all I need is you. If you have to keep any of my brothers and sisters here this morning up at night, please do that as well. Father, may you change lives this morning. May someone this morning come to know the saving grace of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We love you so much, God, and we thank you for this morning. And it's in your great name that we pray. Amen. So the first thing we want to do, we got a lot of work to do, so let's get to it. The first thing we want to do is define justification. Okay? Justification is a legal term that is used throughout the Bible and a lot in Romans. Uh, to declare someone's state of being who is in Christ. So the definition that we have this morning for justification is the complete declaration of innocence. Justification is being completely innocent before God. For me, I've used a phrase for a long time to kind of help myself remember the truth of justification. And it's, it's corny, I'll be honest, it's corny. But that's okay. It's helped me, and what it is is to think about justification is to think about it as just as if I'd never sinned. Just as if I'd never sinned. Now, while that's cute and quippy and it really has helped me, it's not 100% the full truth. There's an author named Jerry Bridges, not Jeff Bridges, Jerry Bridges, who wrote a book, and he's spoken at many different conferences, and he said that justification is not merely thinking about just as if I had never sinned. It, it is that, but it's so much more than that. Justification is the way that God looks at me just as if I'd always obeyed. When the Bible says that I am justified in Christ, it's not just that he looks at me as, as though I had always, that, that I'd never sinned. It's that he's looking at me as I have always obeyed. So this morning, we define justification as complete innocence because of Christ. That's key. Because of Christ, we can have complete innocence as our, our standing before God. And God views us as though we have always obeyed him. If you want to write something down this morning, I'll let you know this is a good thing to write down. Okay, if you want to write it in your Bible, if you want to write it in your phone, if you want to tweet it, just make sure after you tweet it, you get out of it because we don't need the tweets going out all the time. But if you want to write something down, here's the deal. The truth is, church, that God treats us based on the actions of another man. God treats us based on the actions of another man. Now, some of you in this room may say, well, that's not fair. It's not fair at all. And what I will say to that, knowing the end of the story, is before we cast any judgment on what is fair and unfair, let's try to gather some, some facts, and then we can make that judgment later. But the truth is that God treats us based on another man's actions. So what Paul is saying here in Romans 5 is, if God's judging you based on some other man's actions, then you better pick the right man. You better put the right man's actions forward to say, yeah, I want this guy to represent me. That's it. And there's only been two people in all of history that has represented us as humanity. There's only been two men, Adam, the first one, and Jesus, the second one. The first Adam, the first one made in all creation. The only dude that was made at the beginning. He's one. Second is Jesus, who is the firstborn of all creation. So those are the two options that we have to represent us. And so what Paul does here is he starts to show us our need for justification. We've got a definition, complete innocence. Now we've got a need. So let's look at this need. Verse 12 says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man the, and death through sin... And so death spread to all men because all sinned. Crystal clear, right? It's tough. Right here, Paul is referencing the transaction that happened in Genesis 3. If you want to bookmark it, bookmark it. If you, 
If you want to do what my wife does and fold a page over and ruin your book, please fold your page over and ruin your book. My wife is a savage when it comes to reading paperback books. Like, I pray for them after she's done with them. It's like, man, the thing is like, this book's worse than my book. I love you. Oh, by the way, update. She remembered our anniversary, so we win. Awesome. Yeah. More importantly, I remembered, so that was good. He's referencing Genesis 3 at the fall, that moment where there's this weird snake in a tree. It's like a nightmare right there. Like snakes, not good. Snake in a tree, really not good. Snakes on a plane, even worse. The movie is even worse than a snake in a tree is what I'm saying. Paul is referencing this when he says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, that word man there is not like a through humanity. It's like through one man. The original Greek here is through one dude. Don't look it up. I learned that in seminary. Just go with it. We see that it was Adam in Genesis 2 who was commanded, hey, I'm going to put you in this sweet garden. You can run as fast as you want and never get tired. You can jump out of any tree face first and never get hurt. Anything you want to do, you're free to do, except there's one tree in the midst of the garden that has the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Man, don't eat that stuff. Like, don't eat it. Everything else, fair game, go for it. Adam was the only one there. He's the only person that God could have talked to. Eve wasn't around yet. He was the one who was commanded not to eat the fruit. In Genesis 3, we see that Adam was the one that disobeyed God and ate the fruit. Now, a lot of times we make jokes like, well, it was, it was Eve that ate the fruit. No, the Bible says, literally, the stupid dude next to her was the one that messed it all up for us. It's a loose translation. What happened is this woman is standing here talking to a snake, and her husband is just aloof, standing there next to her going, huh, what's that snake doing? I didn't know he could talk. I just named every animal. None of them said anything to me. What's up with this one? So she's standing there, and he says, hey, you should eat this fruit. It's not bad. Just eat it. So she does. And then it says, and her husband who was next to her also ate it. There was no, uh, hey, babe, uh, God told us not to eat that. So as your spiritual leader, let's walk away. Let's go, let's go somewhere else. Like, this isn't for us. No. He just stands there and goes, oh, yeah, I'll take some of that. I'll take some of that. Eats it instantly. He looks at her and goes, whoa, you're naked. She said, whoa, you're naked. Whoa, we're naked. There's a snake talking to two naked people. This is a weird thing. And in that moment, they felt shame. They were like, we got to fix this. Grab some fig leaves. We'll make some clothes out of it. They felt shame. At the moment that Adam ate of this fruit, sin entered the world. And when sin entered the world, we see that death entered with it. It said sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. The moment that Adam sinned, death was required as a payment for that sin. More than fig leaves died that day. It said that God came down and walked through the, walked through the garden looking for them. They were hiding. Good, good job. This is the equivalent of when you babysit and you tell kids, let's play hide and seek. And they go and stand behind the curtain, but the curtain's like this short. And their feet are there. And you're walking by going, I don't know where little Stephen is. Oh, Stephen, where are you? And they're like laughing. God's walking through the garden. He's like, where are you guys? Where are you? And they're like, he doesn't know we're here. <laughs> and he sees him. He's like, what are you doing here? Why are you hiding? Who told you that you were naked? Who let you know that there was anything out of the norm for you? And Eve's like, this snake gave me some fruit. And Adam's like, yeah, she ate it. She gave it to me. That's what happens. She makes dinner. I eat dinner. She gave it to me, I ate it. And God looks at me and says, you knew better. You were the representative of all mankind and you blew it. You had one task. Don't eat that fruit. What'd you do? You ate that fruit. So what God does is he kills some animals. And he made clothes for Adam and Eve. So in that moment, Adam's sin led to death. Not of Adam, which I thought would have been more appropriate but to animals to clothe them. So through sin came death. And that has now been the way that it has been from the beginning. Where there is sin, there is death. Physical death entered our world because Adam sinned. 
And spiritual death has entered because of sin. It separated us from God. So this, just as sin came into the world through one man, Adam, death came through sin. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. If you live a life of sin, the paycheck you will get is death. Physical death, in the ground, dead. And spiritual death, eternity separated from God in hell. It's not a fun thing to talk about, but I'm going to try to lay this out real clear. If, if we die and we do not have Christ as our Savior, we will spend eternity in hell with Satan separated from God. Now that may not like really shake you up because you know, I gave my life to Christ at Awanas 75 years ago. Or I'm a Christian, I, I'm not worried about that. But the thing about it is there's people in your family, there's people in your neighborhoods, there's people at your jobs, there might even be people in this church that if they died today, they would spend eternity in hell. That's a real place with a real thing. And it all happened because one man messed it up for all of us. Whether we like it or not, Adam was our representative for all humanity because he was one guy. He is mankind. He is humanity. He's the human race. And when he messed up, he messed it up for all of us. And if he is the door that humanity walks through, we walk through that door as sinners. And church, we're not sinners because we sin we sin because we are sinners. We have a sin nature. Every baby that is born in the hospital in Gloucester is born with a sin nature. They are a sinner at birth. The moment that they are born, their destiny right then is for hell because of a sin nature. Now there's some theological implications that we can look at with age of accountability, the birth of children, the death of children, how that works, and that's something for another day. But the, the basis of our heart is sinful. And if sin leads to death, it's only grace if God does not, does not have that happen for a small child. But for us here today, we have a sin nature in us because of Adam. We continue reading verse 13. It says, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. The law was, if you sin, you die. That, that, was, that was there before. There was laws. But it was hard to see that laws were broken when there wasn't a law there. So where there is no law, there's no way to break it. Once the law was broken, it was established, this is, this is a law. This is this has been broken here. It says, 14, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses. Even over those whose sinning was not like the transgressions of Adam, who is a type of the one that is to come. The word counted in my, my verse here, uh, in, in the Pew Bibles, it's the word charged. It says that uh, the sins of Adam was counted uh, but the sin was not counted where there is no law. That word can be translated charged, imputed, reckoned, counted. Meaning when Adam sinned, we sinned. We were there at the moment in the garden when Adam sinned. Because why? He was our representative. He was the one that represents us. The words here in verse 14, death reigned. That is a fearsome picture of what a life without Christ looks like. Without Christ, death reigns in our lives. Paul says that Adam was a type of a one that is to come. Here at the end it says, who is a type of one who is to come. We know the one that is to come is Jesus. Spoilers alert, okay? He's talking about Jesus here. Adam was set up as a future picture of Christ as our representative. Adam was a representation of Christ, but the cool thing is, to reference our time in Hebrews, Jesus is far better than Adam. He is a far better Adam than Adam. So we keep reading. My favorite word in all of scripture, but. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift of grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. 
If you skip down to 17, it says, For if because one man's trespass, death reigned through the one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and free gift of righteousness reign in life through one man, Jesus Christ. If you're into marking in your Bible today, underline anywhere you see the words much more or the word abundance. Because Adam, where he did much, Christ did much more more. It said through the sins, the sin, singular, the sin of one man, all humanity was condemned as guilty before God. But through the sins of many, one man's actions gave us a righteousness of life through Jesus Christ. It took one sin for us to mess it all up. But Jesus takes on many sins to make it all right. So right here, Paul is comparing two men, two actions, two results. The two men, the first Adam and the second Adam, Adam and Jesus. The two acts, we have the act of disobedience from when, God, when Adam ate the fruit that God forbid him to eat in Genesis 3, compared to the act of Christ's obedience in leaving the doorstep of heaven to come down here and die for people like you and me who are being represented by Adam. When Jesus came, Adam was our representative. The, gr the great thing about that is he came anyway. Even greater than that is before Adam was made from the dirt of the earth, God knew that Adam would disobey him. He knew that he would sin. He knew that he would separate himself from the perfect love and nature of God, but he made him anyway. Because Jesus wasn't a plan B. Jesus wasn't a, oh no, what are we gonna do? I really didn't think they were going to eat that fruit. Let's brainstorm, guys. What do we do? What do we do? Zap them with lightning? Nah, that took a long time to make them. Uh, Jesus, you want to go down there and fix this? Maybe. And then Holy Spirit, you can go down there and take over after that, you know, and kind of live a month. No. At the beginning, God looked at himself and himself and said, listen, us, me, I'm about to make man in, in our image and I'm going to make it so we can have a relationship. But I want you to know that there's going to be a point soonish where they're going to put a divide in between us. And when that happens, me is going to go down and, and be among them in human form. Live like a human. And, and the other me is going to live among them when you come back. So if we're all in for this... And we're going to do it. Guess what? Spoilers. They were into it. Because they did it. Because we're here. He made us knowing where we would go. And the two results from these two men and these two decisions, one of them led to death, judgment, and condemnation. The other led to life and righteousness and grace. So if we are, in fact, judged based on one man's actions, do you want to be judged on the actions that lead to death, judgment, and condemnation? I surely hope that you would say no to that. Knowing that there's an option to where we can be looked at with the basis of life and righteousness and grace. Adam and Christ were representative men. They acted on our behalf the, the same way a representation of Congress votes for us. Politically, I, I, don't, I don't care where you're at. If you voted for this person, you voted for that person. It doesn't matter. That person who is there, whether you voted for them or not, is a representation of us as a nation. That's what happened here with Adam. We didn't have a choice. We didn't get to vote on Adam. Knowing what we know now, we probably wouldn't have voted on a man who trusted a snake talking to him in a tree about eating some fruit. We would have said, no, let's skip that one. Next. Maybe Eve might have been a better choice. I don't know. We didn't have that choice. He was created as a representation. But thankfully, we didn't have a choice that Christ would be our representation either. That choice is made well before we had a choice. God chose himself to be our representative. Where Adam sinned, I mean, Adam sinned for us, but Christ died for us. So the decision we have to make is, who will I live for? The one that sinned for me or the one that died for me? 
It's important for us to see our history in Adam because we had a history with Adam. I became a Christian when I was 15 years old. For 15 years, Adam was my history. And you can ask my wife, a lot of times now, Adam is still kind of hanging around. There's plenty of times where she just gives me that look of, hmm? I, I know you didn't just say what I think you just said. And the Adam in me goes, no, 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 you misheard me. I didn't, I didn't say that. Like, I, no. There are some times where I'm still represented by that, and it's important for us to see that. Paul says in the verse 12 here that when Adam sinned in the garden, we were there. We were there with him, being represented by him. In Adam, all sinned and all died. Romans says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I went to seminary, believe it or not. You give anybody enough money, they'll give you a degree. I was in seminary for two years, and I remember one night I was driving onto campus. There's railroad tracks where you drive over to get into our campus. And I remember right before I went over those railroad tracks, I looked off to my left, and there was about six fire trucks parked on the street right outside of this house that was on the corner. Lights were going. I was distracted, so I went over there. I was like, what's going on over here? I'm going to go see what's going on. So I kind of parked my car kind of did some intel and found out what was going on. And I found out real quickly that this was kind of a, a training school for firemen in our area. And they were about to burn this house down in order to train firemen to go into the house and get anybody that's out and then to also extinguish the fire. So I was like, I've never seen a house catch on fire. And if I'm going to see one catch on fire, I'd rather it be one that's already condemned to be burned down. So I sat there and watched. It was awesome. And I saw one guy walk up with a match, light a match, and throws it in. It was like an action movie. Like it was almost slow-mo. He was just like, Shh. And then like did the slow walk. And then it was just like, woo. It was awesome. The guy had no hair on the back of his head, but man, it was awesome. And I remember just seeing this house go up in flames. And I knew immediately that these beams in this house, the studs, the insulation, the floor, everything was being consumed by it. And soon I saw these guys rush in to go get things that I obviously were planted in there for them to bring out. And other guys were gathering the hoses and strapping them up on the, uh, the little red thing, the fire, whatever that, hydrant, thank you. Lord bless you today. I hope you get a really good lunch. They were hooking the hose up to the fire hydrant to blow the fire down and take out the house. And I just stood there and I watched it and I thought about in the Bible where it says our God is a consuming fire, that he envelops us in his grace and in his glory. But I thought, man, one match did all that. Now listen, I was born at night. I wasn't born at last night. I know that someone went in there before this guy threw that one match and put an accelerant on everything so that that dude could have the, the action movie moment of throwing that match on there. Like, I know that one match didn't do all that. It was a, a thing there. But I know how fire works. That one match, without an accelerant, could have easily burned down that whole house. That's how fire works with wood. You put it on it, it burns it, it's gone. Fire always wins in the battle between wood. Just, there's, there's no getting around it. Adam was that one match that lit everything on fire. And because of that one match, we all were burned in that fire. We were consumed by the sin that was brought into the world by one man. We developed a sin nature from there. Our inclination is to go against God. If we were to find the word sin, sin is anything that misses the mark of God, anything that goes against the perfect nature of God. It's important for us to know our history in Adam, but it's also important for us to remember our history in Christ because we were there at the moment that Adam ate of that fruit in the garden. We were there the moment that sin came into this world, but we were also there the moment that Christ was on the cross crucified for our sins. Let's try that again to make sure everybody's awake. We were there the moment that all the world was destined for hell, but we were also there the day that Jesus opened the door and said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Any man that comes to me will have access to my Father. We were there the day that Christ was crucified for our sins. 
Adam's offense brought disaster and death upon human race. But it says the free gift, the gift of grace was not like that trespass. It was not like that trespass. Many died through one man's trespass. Much more have the grace of God and the free gift of grace in one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many, an abundance. His grace was given us to, in an abundance, we received it. Christ's death was God's glorious and gracious gift to us. Everything that Adam did far out, I mean, everything that Christ did far outweighed the things that Adam had done. The Bible says that death reigned through Adam to Moses. That, that's a news headline that you hate to buy and read. Death reigns. But the scripture also says in verse 17, for if because one man's trespass death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through one man, Jesus Christ. Death once reigned but now life reigns in Christ. These two men have been compared. This is the need for our justification because we have been represented by one man, Adam. The need for us to be justified before the Lord is because in Adam, we have been condemned as sinners. Without Christ, we will not have this justification will not have eternity with God. And so we move into understanding our means of justification. I'm sure you know how we are justified, but let's spend time in it together. Verse 18 closes a, a parenthesis that Paul has put in this scripture from, from verse 13 to 17. So the, for me, the best way I've been able to read verse, verse 18 is to read it in conjunction with verse 12. Verse 12 says, just as sin came into this world through one man, the death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification for, and life for all men. If we take these two verses and put them together, what Paul is doing is laying out his argument for these people of, if you are represented by one man, pick the right man. You got Adam here and Christ here. In Adam, we have sin. In Christ, we have truth. In Adam, we have death, physical death, spiritual death, separation from God. But in Christ, we have life. We have life, we have eternal relationship with God in heaven, free of all pain, free of all sadness, free of all fear. No tears are shed in heaven because in Christ we have life. In Adam we have judgment, deserved judgment. But in Christ we have grace, undeserved grace. Because when I step to the doorstep of heaven and I've got my laundry list of all the bad decisions I've ever made, and I'm right about to hand it off to God and say, go easy on me. Jesus walks in, takes my list, and looks at his father, looks at himself as God and says, put this on me. This is, this is mine. He's good. Let him in. Because at cross, he took all of my sin on him. And in Adam, we were condemned. In Adam, we were judged guilty. Gavel slammed, bailiff escorting. We're gone, we're on the news. Death reigns. Adam is a sinner. You can fill your name in there as well if you want, but if you want to just use mine, that's cool. It's un unfortunate that I have the same name as the original Adam because everybody's like, oh, things are messing it up for everybody. And I'm like, well, yeah, I'm that old. But in Christ, we're not condemned, we're justified. We are looked at as just as if I had never sinned. But even more, we are looked at as just as if I had always obeyed. Not just that I never did anything wrong, but that I always did everything right because that's who Christ was. Christ always did everything right. Death reigned in Adam, but life reigns in Christ. If you are without Christ, you do not have truth. You do not have life. 
You do not have grace. You have not been justified. Death is reigning in your life if you do not have a relationship in Christ. The best word in that whole thing that I said was the word if. Because with that word, it means that it doesn't have to be that way. You don't have to be destined for hell. The people in your life do not have to be destined by hell. Verse 19 says, For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, we sin because we are sinners. So by one man's obedience the many would be made righteous. Now the law came to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. That does not mean that the law was created so that God could get us or that he could say, ha, you broke a rule again. Check that off the list. That's not what it's saying. What it's saying is the law was created so that we could see our desperate need for somebody to come in and do it for us because we can't do it. And when we were doing that, sin was increasing in our life. The more things that we were told that we shouldn't do, we did. Paul even says that, and we'll get to it later. He says, I know the things that I shouldn't do. Why do I do those things? Why do we have that moment when we're right about to do something we know we shouldn't do? And we say, I know I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. We do that because one man's trespass caused sin in the world, and when the law was given, that sin just kept increasing. But this increasing has a limit. I mean, there's got to be a ceiling to this because it says that through one man's obedience, it's unlimited. It abounds. It's an abundance. It is full. It is overflowing. Verse 21, so that sin reigned, past tense, reigned in death. Grace also might reign, present tense, through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Christ our Lord. In Adam, humanity was in desperate need of justification. In Christ, humanity has an undeserving means of justification. And that's, that's the key word there, undeserving. Undeserving. Earlier this morning, we, we began reinforcing a, a doctrine of representation that anyone that is not in Christ is therefore in Adam. And in Adam, we see the doctrine of representation says you are guilty as charged. But those of us in Christ, that ha what that means is having a relationship with Christ where we have surrendered all. In Christ, we have justification. And if God treats us based on one man's actions, I remember I said some of us might say that's unfair. And I said, let's wait till we have all the facts before we call it fair or unfair first. Well, I think seeing the need for justification and the means of justification, I think it's fair to say the doctor of representations, it's not fair. It's not fair. It's not fair that the heart of God was broken the day that sin came into this world. It's not fair that the heart, the heart of God breaks over and over again as we sin against him. It's not fair that Jesus left the doorstep of heaven to come to this earth. It's not fair that Jesus was mocked, he was beaten, he was ridiculed. He was disrespected. It's not fair that Jesus took on the full wrath of God. That Jesus took the cup of God's wrath and says, I'll finish this. Every last drop. It's not fair that Jesus on the cross of, Christ, uh, on the cross of Calvary had the face of God, the face of his father, the face of himself turn from him. That's not fair because he did nothing wrong. The doctrine of representation is not fair. It's not fair that any of us in this room could be called righteous, considering all the junk we have in our lives, considering all the sins that we hide from one another, considering that Jesus has been our representative more often than we'd like to admit. It's not fair. But it is fair that God would get all the glory for any one person whose life 
is changed and represented by Christ. That's fair. It's fair that he would receive all the glory for allowing us to be representative for Christ. Because it's not fair that I would get a second chance, a third chance, a fourth, a fifth, a 65th, a 70 upon 70,000 chances. That's not fair. But it's fair that if today, this morning, if you are being represented by Adam, it is all fair that God gets the glory for your soul being turned over into life and righteousness and grace in Christ. That's fair. And so I want to give him that option this morning. As the band is coming up this morning, I want to give that option. This morning, if that is you, if you are sitting there saying, you know what, I, my life is represented by Adam. This is the moment that you say, no more, no more. Let's pray. Father, if there is anyone in this room this morning that needs to give their life to Christ, may you stir so hard in them that they cannot sing a word of a song or shake another hand until they get right with you, God. We thank you that we are no longer represented by Adam, but we have Christ. May he be the center of everything that we have, Father. May you change a life this morning. We thank you, God, so much for the way that you love us. It is in your sweet and gracious son's name that we pray. Amen.